Hi, I'm Wei Tang Chen from University of California Riverside. Today I'm going to present how to generate exploit for Linux kernel autobahn write vulnerabilities with the help of our system called Kubi. According to Sysbot Google's kernel 5 in Pineful, there were more than 1,000 Linux kernel bugs discovered during one single year. Given such a large number of bugs we have to deal with, prioritizing the fix for them is critical. One promising direction is to automate the exploit generation and uh, prioritize the bugs that are definitely exploitable. In this work, we focus one common type of vulnerabilities, autobahn write vulnerability. This is the simplified version of CVE 2018-5703 at line 9. We can see that it allocates an object of type 1. We refer to this object as the vulnerable object. And uh, there is a type confusion bug at line 11, where the vulnerable object is casted into an object of type 2. If we take a look at the definition of these two types at the top, we can see that type 2 contains a field of type 1. Therefore, the size of type 2 is larger than the size of type 1. So when we access the second field option at line 12, the written address is beyond the range of the vulnerable object and thus we have an out of bound right. However, if we only look at the first two system calls, we may conclude that it only allows to override with a fixed value. In this example, the value to be overwritten at line 12 is actually from the global variable defined at line 6. But in fact, if we can explore some other part of the kernel code that is not executed by the POC we have, we may find that there is actually another system called defined at line 13 that could change the value of the global variable. So the first challenge we have is that the initial POC does not necessarily manifest the complete capability for the vulnerability. Here are some more examples. The first one is from CV 2016-6187. It allows to overflow only one byte of zero but the size of the vulnerable object is controllable to the attacker. The bottom one is from CV 2017-7184. Although the size of the vulnerable object is fixed, the offside of the overwritten address is controllable. As we can see for different vulnerabilities, the capability of overflow varies significantly. So the second challenge is how we can model the capability of overflow. Intuitively, there are three important dimensions we should consider. How far the write can reach, which is basically the offsite, how many bytes we can write, and uh, what value can be written. The right-hand side of the figure shows the knowledge we have for the vulnerability. We know the size of the vulnerable object. We also know the offsite length and the range of the overwritten value. However, the effect of the overflow depends on the object following the vulnerable object. We refer to the object to be overwritten as the target object. In the motivating example, there is another structure type 3 with a function pointer at the beginning, defined at line 3. We can see that if we can allocate an object of type 3 and put it next to the vulnerable object, then when we trigger the out of bound write to modify the function pointer in the target object, we can easily hijack the control flow by invoking the last system call defined at line 19 to trigger the dereference of the function pointer we modified earlier. So now the question becomes how we can put these two objects together. Well, there is actually a well-known technique called heap function. The idea is that we can prearrange the heap layout because the behavior of Linux allocator is deterministic. Given that each target object is so unique in terms of the critical field we want to overwrite and how we can exploit it, the challenge is how to evaluate exploitability against different target objects. And we also want to have an efficient algorithm to be able to search through hundreds of candidates. In this work, we only generate exploit primitives to achieve control flow hijacking. Some modern defenses like kernel address space layout randomization are considered out of scope. Also, we use some well-known heap function strategies rather than exploring nuances. 
here's the overview of our system specific to other bound write vulnerabilities, which consists of four components. Given one POC, our goal is to assist the exploit generation. Although the whole process of exploit generation sounds complex, the design principle of, of this system is that we could actually decouple the capability extraction from the rest of the pipeline. In this way, we simplify the search space to the point where we only need to check whether a target object we choose could match the capability we summarized. The first step is to perform vulnerability analysis to pinpoint the vulnerable object, as well as all the vulnerability points where other bound access occur. In addition to kernel address sanitizer, we do symbolic tracing to improve its precision. And then we also use symbolic tracing to summarize the capability of this particular POC and store its result in the database. For the same CVE, we may have different POCs and hence different capability summarizations. Now that we have the database of capabilities we summarized, we could check the target objects one by one to see if any of them could match the capabilities. In the case where the vulnerability can be triggered multiple times, our system allows combining capabilities. If we found any solution, we could further synthesize and exploit. If we are not satisfied by the POC we already have, we could explore the POC to find more interesting inputs, and then repeat the whole process. The capability summarization is the, uh, is the crucial part of this work. Recall the three dimensions I mentioned earlier. For each other bound write, we could extract its offsite, length, and overwritten value with symbolic tracing. For one single pass that is executed by one particular POC, we could collect a site of other bound write summarizations. In addition, the path constraints are included because they could be coupled with other bound write. In the motivating example, we conclude that the overwritten value is controllable to the attacker, and uh, its value seems to be arbitrary. But in fact, there is a check at line 14, which prohibits the value to be minus 1. We also consider the size of the vulnerable object for the same reason. In order to explore some other part of the kernel code that is related to the capability, we propose a novel capability-guided fuzzing solution. Existing coverage guided fuzzing solutions are ineffective because they only focus on the coverage feedback and hence are insensitive to the capability. Therefore, we use dynamic instrumentation to hook all the vulnerability points to collect information as the feedback. We also maintain different queues for different feedback. As I mentioned earlier, the effect of overflow really depends on the target object we choose. In general, we consider three types of objects. Objects with function pointers, objects with data pointers, and objects with some special fields like UID and uh, reference counters. Since the code base of Linux kernel is quite stable, we manually construct the database for the target objects. With heap function to prearrange the heap layout, we can ensure the vulnerable and target objects are adjacent to each other. Therefore, given the capability summarization and one target object, we construct a memory model only containing these two objects and apply all the overflow on the memory model. And then we could query the constraint solver whether the critical field in the target object can be overwritten to the desired payload with respect to the path constraints. For the motivating example, we can modify the first eight bytes of the target objects and uh, type 3 happens to have a function pointer at the beginning. Therefore, the constraint solver can produce a solution. On the other hand, since the vulnerability does not allow to temper the second 8 bytes, we fail to find a solution for type 4. We, e we evaluate our system against 17 different other bound right vulnerabilities in Linux kernel. Seven are from CVE database, and the rest without CVE numbers are from SysVault. For the seven CVEs, four of them have public exploits. With our system, we could generate seven more exploits. 
Note that we count the number of exploits based on the target object we used. For those without CV numbers, only one has been started, and thus has one public exploit. With our system, we also generate seven more exploits. As shown in this table, we break down the time cost for each step. As we can see, um, the solving time per target object varies from as small as one second to about three minutes, indicating that our system can efficiently search through hundreds of target objects. For the fuzzing part, we attempted to compare our solution with the vanilla syscaller, but the syscaller is not designed to explore the crushing input and thus fail to produce any result in the limited time budget. Although in this work we only focus on out of bound rights vulnerability, the principle of separating capability summarization from exploitability evaluation can also be applied to other types of vulnerabilities such as use of the free and the double free. This is because for kernel it usually has an extremely large search space and we also observe that vulnerabilities sometimes can be converted from one type to another, but all of them require to corrupt some kernel data. That's all for my talk. Thanks for your listening.